Welcome to the Quillette Podcast. I'm your host, Jonathan Kay, a senior editor at Quillette. Quillette is where free thought lives. We are an independent grassroots platform for heterodox ideas and fearless commentary. If you'd like to support the podcast, you can do so by going to quillette.com and becoming a paid subscriber. This subscription will also give you access to all our articles and early access to Quillette social events. Welcome to the Quillette Podcast. I'm Jonathan Kay. If there's one subject that percolates below the surface in most of the content we produce at Quillette, it's free speech. Whether we're denouncing mobbing, or defending the scientific method from ideological attack, or tallying up the costs of groupthink, the subtext is usually that more free speech would help solve the problem. Well, today, forget the subtext. We're talking about free speech full stop because that's the title of the new book from this week's Copenhagen-based guest, Jacob Mishangama. Or to cite the title in full, Free Speech, A History from Socrates to Social Media. If you've heard Jacob's podcast, Clear and Present Danger, you'll know that he's a defender of free speech. But he also has a historian's appreciation for how fragile free speech can be. For most of human history, free speech as we now know it was unknown. If you told your average Roman or biblical-era Jewish rabbi or medieval lord that we should all be allowed to say whatever we want, you know, let's get rid of the king, there is no god, down with the bourgeoisie, that sort of stuff, they would have thought you were crazy. In fact, even now, in 2022, as Jacob and I discuss, free speech is imperiled from all sides. One of the most fascinating sections of your book was about the Dutch Republic, in the 17th century, yeah, which, at least by, by the standards of the era, uh, this is still the Inquisition, uh, was extremely liberal about the kind of speech it tolerated. You also point to the fact that it was around this time the distinction between actions and speech started to become spoken about. Could you talk a little bit about how that distinction emerged? One of the really early defenses of free speech and, and sort of universal toleration is by a, a very fascinating Dutch uh, heterodox uh, thinker called Dirk Kornhert, who, who in 1582 writes a symposium on freedom of conscience, I think is, is the title. And it's this dialogue between various theologians and prominent persons about basically tolerance and, and so on. And, and in that a book sort of his alter ego says that you know it has always been a sign of of tyranny to uh, ban books to to squelch the truth and he also says that if you want to combat uh, heresy you should kill the the heretic with words rather than than with the sword so you see you see that idea there and it's made of course more explicit by spinoza in 1670 who explicitly sort of distinguish between words and actions. He, he may not do it uh, completely consistency, even Spinoza has his sort of <laughs> ifs and buts, uh, but compared to where we are in the age, um, it's, it's obviously a very important and, and decisive defense uh, of free speech. But, but I think it's important to note that in the Dutch Republic, Free speech does not, it, it doesn't depend on sort of constitutional protection or laws explicitly protecting um, press freedom. It's more that there's a comparatively cosmopolitan atmosphere, at least in, in the cities. Uh, it's, it's open to, to, to foreigners. A lot of prominent thinkers seek refuge in, in the Dutch Republic. And trade, of course, is, is important to the Dutch. And one of the things that they can trade in is books that they can then sell to other uh, European nations where censorship is, is strict. So it becomes sort of what I call <laughs> the Dutch dark web of the time in the sense that the Dutch Republic becomes the printing house of Europe. So more books are printed and consumed there than, than in other uh, European states. And many of those books are then smuggled across borders into to other European states. You have a, I guess, necessarily brief overview of the ancient roots of the discussion of what we now call free speech. And you talk about the Hittite laws. This is pre-Judaic. If anyone rejects a judgment of the king, his house will become a heap of ruins, which uh, doesn't sound that liberal. <laughs> <laughs> and then... A greater man than yourself, this is in reference to the an Egyptian pharaoh, speak when he invites you and your worth will be pleasing. <laughs> yeah. 
for those who are trying to reconcile free speech to the Judeo-Christian tradition, it's pretty thin pickings in the sense that much of the Old Testament is a catalog of what you're not allowed to say. And it was just, I think, taken for granted by, by religious authorities that if you said the wrong thing, I mean, that could be a capital crime. Yeah. The irony is that when we talk about very modern progressives, we talk about oh, how they're such snowflakes you know, if you say the wrong thing, that's a thought crime to them. Isn't that paradoxically kind of the whole basis of a lot of what's in the Bible? Yeah, and, and probably not all limited to Judeo-Christian. Uh, I, I also mentioned sort of Mesopotamian cultures and so on. Basically, you could say that laws on speech uh, in ancient times tended very much to protect the ruler against their subjects uh, and not the other way around, whereas today we think of free speech as as protecting citizens against their politicians uh, or those who exercise power you know, on their behalf. Of, of course, there's a, there's a paradox in, in that when liberals find themselves adopting sort of arguments that, that were basically used to, to limit free speech and have, have been used for, 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 for millennia. But, you know, I think that and maybe we can, we can come back to that, that free speech is uh, an incredibly difficult concept for human beings to, to handle. It's almost as if we're sort of our pre-installed software is its default mode is intolerance. And then we've created this wonderful patch, which is free speech and tolerance, but that patch needs to be constantly sort of updated and guarded with firewalls uh, because if our original software will sort of try to override it uh, and, and get back to, to intolerance. Uh, and, and, and I think that's difficult for, for most people, whatever their ideological orientation. How much of the reflexive, I would argue maybe even evolutionarily programmed suspicion of free speech is based on our need to create coherent tribes? Like going back to the age of Constantine, Arian heretics, maybe they would change the prayers at Alexandria or something like that. It would become this rupture in the community that, that could only be repaired through great acts of violence. You weren't just saying speech people disagreed with, you were signaling there is a rupture in the tribe. Yeah, I, I think, you know, it's not a theme that I develop, uh, but it would be really interesting to to, ha to to have the history of free speech sort of illuminated through evolutionary psychology and, 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 and other disciplines. I'm, I'm just a lawyer, so, <laughs> but I think you're, you're absolutely right that free speech is seen as a threat to, to society. And also, you know, it's difficult for modern human beings to realize and recognize how serious a crime or, or threat speech that was nonconformist constituted to people prior to sort of the, the seats of enlightenment. You know, if you, if you adopted the wrong religious views, for instance, it not only threatened the salvation of one individual, it sort of polluted all of society and ultimate, ultimately it invited the wrath of divine intervention to punish uh, all of society and therefore cleansing society of heretics or blasphemers was ultimately seen uh, as an act of, of good. You see that in Thomas Aquinas, for instance, who's one of the, the most important philosophers in, in, in Western history, has a long, detailed explanation of why it is justified to kill obstinate uh, heretics. So woke. He was always so woke. <laughs> yeah, that, uh, that was just taken for granted that, that there was a danger there. You constituted a clear and present danger, not only to yourself, but to the wider community. Uh, and therefore, you had to be uh, punished. To, to avert those dangers. You have a very interesting section, the chapters uh, Luther, Gutenberg, and the Viral Reformation. Mm -hmm. And we, we touched on this a little bit with the Dutch Republic and the fact that there was a commercial element to it. If, if you ha promote free speech, you just generate more content and you sell more books. How much did capitalism turbocharge what would eventually become something resembling modern free speech. You do talk about Luther and what people forget is sometimes Luther was a He sort of completely changed uh, everything around. You know, no one could get even close to selling as many tracts and pamphlets. And he was just like prolific. You know, he'd churn out uh, pamphlet and tract uh, after the other, you know, translate the New Testament into to German. And, you know, this guy comes along with, with a Twitter account and gets... Uh, Blue check immediately. <laughs> Yeah, no, but it, it's a bit like, you know, I know this is a bit of a ridiculous comparison, but it's like a Joe Rogan upending, you know, traditional media. Suddenly, you know, 
CNN used to have, uh, you know, a lot of viewers, and then suddenly comes Joe Rogan, who has a completely different format, and everyone just that's how the Pope saw it exactly, and and so and 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 Luther sort of appeals to ordinary people, so he starts writing in German. He he writes much more punchy. He uses cartoons that becomes memes. He writes in, in German so ordinary people can understand it, and also in a way that if you're illiterate, someone can read it to you, and it's a very different way to appeal to emotions and, and instincts of people than sort of dry theological t- treatises in Latin. And it it, it is it becomes a challenge, of course, to, to the Catholic Church, which suddenly sees its authority being challenged out in the open. And, and again, you know, we can come back to this distinction between elitist and egalitarian free speech, which I argue is, is central to, to the history of free speech. But it's one thing for the Catholic Church, for instance, in, in medieval times, it came around to accept that, you know, having a small elite of learned people discussing, you know, using reason and pagan philosophy, Aristotelian uh, philosophy was, was a good thing. You know, it, it even contributed and it developed new orthodoxies. So that was not such a threat. But when you have someone like Luther, who just completely rejects the authority of the church and then appeals to the to the masses this is seen as a as a mortal threat and so luther is invited to the diet of worms and put before the emperor and and, and he basically says you know I won't recant, you know, show me a passage in the Bible where I'm wrong, but I can't go against my conscience. And so, and then, of course, there comes this edict by the emperor, which sort of, and he becomes the equivalent of enemy of the state. So he, he's banished. He's it's canceled. Yeah, he, he's, he's canceled with, <laughs> yeah. with somewhat more serious consequences than what would happen to, to a Joe Rogan or, or something like that. So basically, you know, yeah, he, he, he is lucky to escape because he has supporters among German princes that he's lucky basically to escape the, the fate of, of earlier reformers like Jan Hus, who was burned at the stake. That, that could easily have, have happened to him. But, but ultimately, it's interesting with Luther is that he argues that freedom of conscience is important, but once the genie out of, is out of the bottle, he sort of is horrified by the consequences that his reformation has unleashed. Because I, I think Luther basically sees, I have now identified the truth. Uh, this is Christianity. You know, the, the Catholic Church has been selling us all these the, these lies. They've perverted Christianity. I have now identified the truth of Christianity. Here, this is you know, this is true Catholicism, if you like. But by giving access to the Bible, Bible to ordinary people, encouraging children to be taught to read so, so that they can read the, the Bible and his interpretation of them, ordinary people start reading it. And, you know, if the Pope has no final authority, why should they, why should they slavishly follow some ornery, constipated German monk, you know, and then all these, this alphabet soup of, of Protestant uh, sex pops up. And some of them would sort of extremely radical ideas that are completely alien to, to Luther, like peasants who they don't want to live like basically slaves. And so they revolt. And, and Luther writes this tract that they should be, you know, slaughtered. And they are. And, you know, Anabaptists who, you know, find no evidence for child baptism and uh, and so on. And, and then Luther becomes extremely intolerant, arguing for death penalty for blasphemy with reference to, to the Old Testament. And, our, and of course, as every good conspiracy theorist ultimately ends up with, uh, with going after the Jews. The oldest trick in the book. Even the Crusaders did it. <laughs> As an English speaker, we tend to venerate English champions of free speech. We talk about, you know, John Stuart Mill. Yeah. But a lot of your book, you show that the path to free speech in many ways runs through Germany. Yeah. Uh, in your section where you're talking about 19th century, I believe they're called the Carlsbad Laws. German Confederation in the early 19th century had this... Yeah very comprehensive system of censorship going through the mail. It was something 20th century Soviets would have recognized. It was basically after the end of the Napoleonic Wars, where, you know, Europe becomes extremely censorious. You know, free speech is seen as extremely dangerous because it's free speech that had led to the French Revolution. Someone like the Austrian diplomat Metternich uh, and others saw a need to completely reimpose top-down control over free speech. And, and the Carlsberg decrees are an essential part of that. But it's all over the continent. You mentioned a famous German poet, Heinrich Heine, if I'm pronouncing that correctly. I mean, this is a quote many people will know. When they burn books, they will also burn people in the end. He wrote a lovely poem, which was only four words. And you reproduce it on page 220 of your book. And the poem is, the German censors 
blank, 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 idiots, <laughs> blank, 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 blank. Yeah. Maybe you could talk a little bit about the role of satire in promoting free speech. Even going back to, to ancient times, there were people who would dance around censorship with metaphor and allegory. Yeah. I'm thinking even getting into the, the, the Russian novelists like uh, Nikolai Gogol. His book, The Government Inspector, was like a satire of life in Tsarist times, which there's this famous story that even the Tsar himself came to see it and laughed at it. But he had to dance around the things you could say and couldn't say, so a lot of it was done in symbols. Could you talk about how that kind of indirect kind of speech was part of the battle for free speech? The poem was by Heinrich Heine, who was this this German radical uh, who, along with Marx, um, was, you know, interestingly, Marx was a was a big proponent of of, of press freedom and and had to was hounded around uh, Europe. And I, I think, you know, I think it's a it's a very old way to sort of challenge uh, authority because you can always sort of hide behind humor say oh but this wasn't serious humor i think is absolutely crucial which is is one of the reasons why it was to me so shocking that that many uh, liberals in in our age were were unwilling to get behind the defense of the cartoons in in the danish newspaper person or support charlie hebdo that tradition of using humor to challenge authority has been absolutely instrumental in, uh, in establishing the right to free speech. That aside you made about Marx is very interesting because I, I think it's a theme in your book, but I also have observed it in modern life, is that the faction in any political dispute that is out of power is the one that is most in favor of free speech. And the one that has entrenched its its interests in in politics is the one that is most suspicious of free yeah. speech. Uh, is, this, is this a universal pattern, would you say? Yeah, and it, it is really interesting. A lot of those who are sort of critical of free speech, or at least sort of think that maybe free speech has become too important of a value in, in modern liberal societies, will say, well, free speech entrenches unequal power relationships, and, and therefore we have to make certain limits on free speech in order to equalize uh, those power uh, relations. But what I would argue is that you don't equalize power relationship, you ultimately invert them. And, uh, and apart from that, free speech may be the most powerful engine of equality that man has ever stumbled upon. But, but you know, you can take uh, many examples. You could take the early Christians who were like a, a strange Jewish cult and then sort of grows, but is, is, is subjected to, to persecution on and off in, in, uh, by, by in the Roman Empire. But then it becomes the state religion of the Roman Empire. And suddenly Christians are not only persecuting their former persecutors and pagans, but they're also persecuting Christian heretics and do that for a very long time. So, so that's an inversion of, of power relations. And you see it, of course, with, with socialists. Socialists are hounded throughout, throughout Europe in many places. So uh, Germany is a great example. So after Germany is, is unified by Bismarck, they adopt a press law which gives some protection to, to, to press freedom, but he, he adopts these anti-socialist laws. So, so socialist and social democratic journalists are put in prison. You know, they're censored. Uh, you know, it's a really, really tough repression uh, of, of, of socialists. And of course, socialists are also persecuted by in, in Tsarist Russia. Uh, Stalin spent seven stints in Siberian exile. But the first thing that the Bolsheviks do when they get into power is to issue these decree that limit free speech. And they have this internal discussion amongst them, the Bolsheviks. So you have some factions that, you know, we, we were persecuted. Censorship was one of the most important remedies to keep us down. We can't, you know, establish a new totalitarian system. And, and Lenin is absolutely adamant that, you know, free speech is basically a weapon of the bourgeois class. Uh, and therefore, free speech uh, cannot be be given. You know, it's, he, I think he compares it to, to, you know, it's as dangerous as bombs and, and machine guns. And, and so the Bolsheviks uh, suspend free speech and, of course, never reinstate it. And now a message from one of our commercial partners, BetterHelp Online Therapy. And a reminder that it's never a bad time to talk about taking care of yourself. I'm sure many of the people listening to this podcast spend a lot of time taking care of others, but how often do you neglect your own needs, especially when it comes to mental health? Fear, anxiety, and depression aren't things that anyone should have to go through alone. And I speak from experience when I say that it helps to have a therapist to talk to when things get difficult. For those looking for a convenient option, 
BetterHelp is online therapy that offers video, phone, and even live chat sessions with your therapist. And you don't have to see anyone on camera if you don't want to. It's much more affordable than in-person therapy, and you can be matched with a therapist in under 48 hours. Give it a try and see why more than 2 million people have used BetterHelp online therapy. Quillette podcast listeners get 10% off their first month by going to betterhelp.com slash quillette. That's B-E-T-T-E-R-H-E-L-P dot com slash Q-U-I-L-L-E-T-T-E. And now back to our Quillette podcast. Lenin was admirably forthright about his blatant hypocrisy on all such matters. Yeah. Just because there's so much correspondence that survives between Lenin and his, his lieutenants where he <laughs> would always brush aside these principled considerations. Yeah, probably not even hypocritical. He's just about open about, you know, I'll use free speech to further my ideals we can, but free speech is certainly not an ideal of a dictatorship of the proletariat. You, there's no room for, for free speech. Free speech can sort of only be sort of through the ventriloquism of the, the party central committee. That that's That's about it. The period between 1917 and early 1920s, a period of so-called war communism, where there was a civil war in Russia, from the Bolshevik point of view, this existential struggle for the soul of the country. And one theme you see throughout history is that war is the enemy of free speech. Yeah. And you see that in the United States with the sedition laws. Yeah. You even saw it as recently in the war on terrorism. George W. Bush's attorney general, uh, when people complained about civil liberties, he talked about giving voice to the the phantoms of lost liberty, like using really creepy language to, to suggest that people should keep their mouths shut. I mean, even during the French Revolution, one of the tools Robespierre used to shut people up is claiming that there are all these conspiracies afoot on behalf of the Austrians. Yeah. Uh, and a lot of people went to the guillotine on that basis. Oh, absolutely. It's, it's one of the most powerful drivers of intolerance. It's, it's really interesting. So in May 1798, uh, Madison warns Jefferson. He, he writes him and says something. He says... Perhaps it's a universal truth that the loss of liberty at home is to be charged provisions against danger, real or pretended, from abroad. So, so that's basically he foreshadowing. Yeah, yeah. So he he foreshadows this that that and and you know uh, then a, a month or two later the Sedition Act is passed in in the U.S. Which uh, the background of that is that you know the, the Americans fear a war with the French. And the, 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 the founding generation has sort of engaged in an intellectual civil war, if you like, with, with very different ideas about the, the future direction of the country. Uh, so, so, so Madison really gives voice to what you're saying there. But, and, and Robespierre is another fascinating figure because, you know, as late as 1791, he has almost sort of this proto-libertarian position on free speech when his faction is is not in power in, in revolutionary France, but then he sort of becomes the, the top dog and, and institutes the terror. And of course, that is very much fueled by the fact that France, you know, goes to war with just about everyone <laughs> um, um, and, and, and also is engaged in, in a civil war at, at, at home. So, so that very much radicalizes the whole atmosphere. But you also see it in, in Britain where Prime Minister Pitt adopts a slew of ever more um, stringent free speech restrictions against sedition and, 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 and so on, that is motivated by the fact that France also declares war and, and, and this dread of the French Revolution spreading to, to British soil. Um, so, so yes, I would very much say that this uh, war and national security is, is, a, is a perfect example. And even, you know, you know, it could also be other sort of threats that, that are seen as an, an emergency. You know, COVID uh, has seen a number of governments adopt really st uh, stringent laws against false information. And in many authoritarian states, that is being used as a way to crack down on, on political speech critical uh, of, of, of the government. When we talk about free speech, or in your case, write a book about it, the central power structure you're talking about is the power of the state mm -hmm. to tell people what they can say and what they can't say. I did some reporting for Quillette. I went to Milwaukee to this convention of YouTubers, and they were they were talking a lot about what they were allowed to say, what they were, weren't allowed to say. But it's interesting is that very few of them mentioned government. What they talked about were the content policies of YouTube, of Twitter, of Facebook. Mm -hmm. I don't think any of them really feared that someone from the government would come knocking on their door. What they really feared was that their YouTube channels would get demonetized. Yeah. 
or PayPal or, you know, their Twitter account would get suspended or something like that. Is there any precedent in the history of free speech for what are essentially corporate actors acting as de facto agents of censorship and deciding what kind of things can be said or not said? You could point to the stationers company in, in, in England, which had sort of a, was given a, a monopoly and, and basically was acted as the as a censor on behalf uh, of the government um that was sort of state brand that was sort of like a public private partnership if you <laughs> use modern terminology judge Stuart mill in on liberty has a section which i think uh, has been forgotten but where he he argues that basically free speech does not depend only against protection the, against the magistrate but the tyranny of opinion and the tendency of society to impose its views on dissenters can be just as tyrannical as uh, uh, as laws. Uh, and he's, of course, talking about the stifling norms of Victorian England uh, at the time. But I think that's a really important insight. And it also chimes back to sort of the origins of free speech in the Athenian democracy, where they had this concept of parisia, which which means something like uninhibited speech which did not depend on any constitutional protection, but was basically a, a culture where you could be in the marketplace in, in the Agora and, and have discussions uh, about things. You know, if you were a player, you could set up an academy where you could teach philosophies that were very critical of the Athenian democracy. And, and, and so the culture of free speech, I think, is ultimately more important than the laws because the yeah. culture of free speech will inform how the laws are, are, are being shaped, interpreted, and adopted. So, for instance, take the First Amendment in the United States. The wording hasn't changed, but the interpretation by the Supreme Court has changed dramatically. So, from in 1798, having no problem with critics of Judd Adams being imprisoned, whether politicians and, or, or newspaper editors, to uh, in, in World War I, peaceful activism of uh, against the uh, American involvement in World War One could send you to prison for 10 or 20 years. Supreme Court had no problem with that. And then sort of uh, in the second half of the 20th century, a gradual development towards developing into the most speech protective constitutional provision in the world. And, and I think ultimately what drive that was it was a change in the culture of free speech. George Orwell says some of the same thing. In, in a foreword to Animal Farm called On the Freedom of the Press, which was only published in 1972, he says in, in Britain, you know, wartime censorship had not been that bad, actually, but the, the greatest threat to free speech was it, one that, you know, the press was owned by a few wealthy men, but also that the liberal intelligentsia had this orthodoxy and, and red lines that, that didn't allow dissenting uh, voices to, to be heard. So I think there's a strong but neglected free speech philosophy, which stresses that private threats to, to free speech can be every bit as, as serious as state and an official restriction, and that the culture of free speech is important, and that predates the digital age. But that problem has only been exacerbated in our digital age, where you have huge centralized platform that de facto define the red lines of much debate. That does not mean, in my opinion, I would not argue that YouTube or Facebook or Twitter should be legally bound to uphold First Amendment or human rights uh, standards since they're, they're private actors. But I don't think, on the other hand, sort of that we can just say just because they're private actors, it, it doesn't have anything to do with free speech, how they content moderate or their, what their policies are. I have deliberately avoided asking you about modern controversies, Joe Rogan and Spotify, simply because... I think a lot of people listening to this podcast probably have just listened to a dozen other podcasts where they talk about nothing but those things. Yeah. That said, uh, when you write a book like this, it takes a couple of years to write. How much did events that took place while you were writing it, controversies about what you were allowed to say about, say, COVID vaccines or, you know, people getting thrown off social media for questioning gender orthodoxies? Were there diversions that you had to take because of stuff that was plucked from the headlines? Well, I would say, you know, it's. I really only get into sort of contemporary times in the last two chapters. Uh, yeah, but so you that, have, you pepper in modern references, even when you're describing the ancient stuff. Yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah, sure. Uh, that, that's true. But the book is, uh, and, and the podcast that preceded it, was very much the, the raison d'etre of, of that was that I saw that we we're living in, going through sort of a free speech recession. And, and so the modern examples that just keep coming up were more or less 
are just continuations of that free speech recession. And one of the, my big worries is that liberal democracies are contributing to this free speech recession. So it's not a surprise that authoritarian states limit free speech. That's sort of the, the 101 of authoritarianism since the overthrow of the, the Athenian democracy, free speech is the first victim of that. So when authoritarianism is on the march, free speech will suffer. But what we see is that free speech is, even by open democracies, increasingly seen as a threat more than as a fundamental value and something that has to be reined in with, with top-down controls. You see that in Canada, you see that in Denmark. And so it was it was really that development that caused me to, to write the book. And so all these controversies that we see now were, were, were simply continuations of that. And I've sort of tried to include what I thought were the most sort of prescient ones, but they just keep popping up. So, you, you know, you could have written a thousand pages of just about what has happened in the past five years, probably. So I, I'm going to let you go. But, but before I do, I just want to bring it back to the Dutch Republic, where, as we talked about, one of the reasons it was such a liberal place by the standards of the time was in reaction to the over-the-top inquisition theocracy imposed by the Habsburg Catholics. It brings to mind the fact that this is as true now as it was then. The rights that wither, the rights that often ebb away are the rights we take for granted. Yeah. And I notice here in Canada, since you mentioned it, some of the people who are the most fierce defenders of free speech are people who come from Iran or people who have historical memories of Eastern Europe under the yeah. communists or people who come from countries where free speech wasn't something you put in air quotes and talked about how it causes trauma to people. Free speech was a very, very precious thing. And the lack of free speech might mean that your relatives were sent to jail and, and never seen from again. Is part of this debate about free speech, you know, we can talk about it in theory all we want, but ultimately it's the result of a certain kind of cultural and historical memory where when we see the result of a lack of free speech, we guard it jealously. Yeah. But then we live our life in a free society for decades and decades. It's something we just take for granted. And, you know, we just let college students piss it away because it's something they were born with. And so familiarity breeds contempt and they're on to, to more esoteric ideologies about identity. We can write books and we can have podcasts, but ultimately it's just the sweep of history that's going to dictate how much we jealously guard free speech. Yeah, I think that's, a, you know, taking free speech for granted, I think is definitely part uh, of the problem. So when you haven't sort of felt the dangers of authoritarianism close, you know, people that were born generations that were born after the Cold War, <laughs> especially in the digital age, maybe their view of free speech is that free speech is what allows extreme voices and, and uh, disinformation to thrive. And so which isn't wrong. No, it's not wrong. And it's, it's a difficult principle, because if you take free speech for granted, all the, the, the benefits of it, you, it's, it's, it's like breathing the air, and all the harms and costs of free speech have become much more visible then, you know, the negativity bias of many human beings will tend to say, well, then we have to do something about this principle and surely we can remove the, the bad things and while, while keeping the, the, the good things and, and how valuable are the, the, the benefits anyway. Uh, so I think that's a, that's a huge thing. But I think it's also, you know, free speech in and of itself does not provide deeper meaning to human beings. Or maybe it does when you're the revolutionary generation. It's the operating yeah. system of meaning, but it's not the meaning itself. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so if you're like the, the, the revolutionary generation of, of the American founders, it provides meaning and social cohesion to fight for free speech against the British because the British are using repression to fight against you. But once the revolutionary war is won, then free speech is suddenly a, a principle that amplifies your differences and the social cohesion erodes and free speech is then seen uh, as a danger because if you have found sort of this great overarching ideology, whether secular and religious, that you think society should reflect, then uh, why should you allow dissenting uh, voices? You know, if it's racial justice, that should be sort of the meta narrative, or if it's on the new right, you know, if it's revival of the holy alliance, <laughs> then free speech is, is seen as something that allows dangerous and degenerate ideas to flourish. And what's the value of it? Uh, this gets to the central problem of liberalism, which is that civil liberties, liberalism have no dependable constituency. Yeah, it's very difficult to mobilize. You know, you can mobilize around free speech 
when you're sort of seeing oppression and, and the Cold War was maybe a great catalyst for, for free speech activism because you clearly see what it meant to live in a free society. It was part of identity to have a free society with a free press, whereas dissidents were thrown in jail on the other side of, of the Iron Curtain. But today, you know, free speech and open democracy is, is, is often about, you know, defending douchebags and, and you know. <laughs> like us. <laughs> <laughs> so, so what's the value of that? How does that provide meaning to you and, and why? And then, then free speech suddenly becomes at best sort of a very distant, abstract, theoretic principle. Jacob Mashangama is the author of the newly published book, Free Speech, A History from Socrates to Social Media, published by Basic Books. Jacob, thanks so much for being on the Colette podcast. Thank you, John. I really enjoyed the conversation. Thank you. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Quillette Podcast. Quillette is where free thought lives. We are an independent, grassroots platform for heterodox ideas and fearless commentary. If you'd like to support the podcast, you can do so by going to quillette.com and becoming a paid subscriber. This subscription will also give you access to all our articles and early access to Quillette social events. 